Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday to you. Happy springtime. <laughs> Glad you guys are here joining us today for the Kindred Spirits to everybody here in the room, as well as our uh, friends, the Grizzlies that are online watching this live. Don't forget, you can go back and watch the replay on the Adam State YouTube channel as well. Uh, my name is Jeff Gallegos. I'm one of the representatives today uh, supporting the Equity Board, uh, helping everybody with their DEI questions, any answers that you might need regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're here to support a lot of the programs that happen on campus and make sure that we are are all doing our best to serve the diverse population that we have. Um, I'm really honored today to be able to introduce to you our professors from the School of Science. We have Umes Batarai, Assistant Professor of Chemistry. He's gonna to talk to us about some science here in the San Luis Valley, along with uh, Professor David Bertolatis. Please uh, join me in welcoming everybody and enjoy today's lecture and your lunch. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, presence today. And uh, you already know we are two STEM faculties and we have been implementing these uh, CURE projects, which are CURE based research experience project since last four or five years. Uh, and today we'll be talking about our experience related to designing and implementing these research projects uh, in different classes that we teach. So uh, let's start with uh, understanding uh, about course-based undergraduate research experience. And I would start with uh, one of the pioneers of this field, uh, Erin L. Dolan, Professor Dolan. Uh, she is one of the uh, member of leadership team who is, uh, which started a Cure Net. That's the network of educators who have been teaching uh, CURE projects all around the US. And since then, uh, she has been mentoring lots of uh, CURE educators, uh, including us. So based on her definition, uh, a, a course-based undergraduate research experience uh, must engage students in scientific practices, basically teaching them the scientific way to do the research or uh, generate the knowledge, and uh, by doing so, uh, most likely they will make some discoveries, right? And uh, obviously, uh, all types of research work uh, involves some kind of iterative work. It is more like a feedback loop mechanism. You do the experiment, um, evaluate your result, and based on that, you might have to repeat certain thing with a more restructured question, and that's what they are supposed to do, and most importantly, they learn to work uh, in a group, so how a collab collaborative work has to happen. So that's how uh, she defines, she and uh, one of the co-authors define uh, course-based undergraduate research experience. Whereas there are some other uh, texts you can read through, and there is one more text edited by Nancy H. Hensel, she is one of the pioneer in the field with uh, experience in academia as well as administrative work. And based on these other two texts, uh, course-based undergraduate research experience is defined as something, a research work, that is embedded into course curriculum. And uh, all students must participate. We cannot um, choose one or other rather than uh, will give more like equal opportunity to all the students to participate in research, and they work collaboratively. So we, we basically encourage more group work and collaborative work in uh, cure projects. Whereas, uh, so other important factors that uh, differentiate a cure project from uh, other work is basically they are introduced to research methodology and a scientific way to do research and outcomes are unknown. So that's one of the most important characteristics associated to any research. So when we do regular lab uh, work, a lot of things are pretty uh, straightforward and we have expected results and most likely our students will get that result. There will not be much things that are uncertain, but in research, a lot of things are uncertain and unknown. That's how they learn. They learn by both process, whether they fail or they get it done, they learn from that. 
And uh, next important, no matter what uh, research we do, one of the most important uh, you know, process or one of the most important thing that we have to do is to communicate our result, right? So scientific communication is one of the most important part of doing research, and we all should be able to communicate that in whichever ma uh, way possible. So these, these are some of the characteristic features related to course-based undergraduate research experience, and I hope it is clear enough what we are doing over here. Now, let me go over um, the differences between the CURE project and other type of research work, so including research internships, okay? How they are different. So here, yeah, obviously, whenever someone is here for STEM degree, uh, we encourage them to go for as many internships as possible because internship gives a more, uh, you know, um, ground, you know, like basically experience related to their own domain, what's happening in the industry, and what are the skill sets the industry is demanding, right? So basically they get to know those things when they go for internship. That's why we encourage them to go for internship and uh, depending on how much, how much resource we have and our network and whatever we can do, we try to connect them to um, employers and the um, organizations that offer internship and it is our goal to uh, send as many students as possible to internship. But it is almost impossible to send all of our STEM students to internship. That's why the student who get opportunity to intern most likely will be way ahead of a student who just depend on labs and regular course to learn science. So this, this might create a disparity among our students. That's why we are introducing CURE as a way to fill that gap. So we can fill the gap between the student who have a, a huge like number of internships in their CB versus the student who have never done any research. And we can uh, use CURE to fill that gap. And if you see this table, if you, if you go through this table, you'll see the basic difference between CURES and research internships. Usually, scale-wise, we do CURE project with like the whole class. If we have a class size of 50, all 50 out of 50 students will be involved in research. But that is almost impossible to go for internship. So we cannot have to hire or we cannot send all of those 50 students for internships. Next one, that differentiates CURE project from research internship are, usually when you go for research internship, you will have a manager or you will have a researcher as your mentor above you. And one mentor may be able to uh, guide or mentor two or three, um, uh, not more than that, right? But in CURE project, one faculty can guide whole class, whole group of students. We might have TA assisting us, but it will be like one instructor to many student relationship. That's how we'll guide student for cure type of research experience. Next, very important, I really uh, find these two factors uh, more impactful compared to other is the enrollment. So internship organ organization that are offering internship are quite selective. They ask for uh, past kind of experience or the performance that a student in, uh, has. So they are very selective on hiring who, who goes for internship or so. But we are open enrollment. We enroll all of our students for our research, right? So it is open enrollment. That's why it will enhance the equity and inclusion into STEM. Uh, so it is considered better to have cure project over internship if we want to enhance the inclusion and equity into our STEM uh, science. So next one that is very important for our student is time commitment. So most of our undergrad students are taking classes and side by side they are working uh, outside, right? So they have very limited time to learn things. That's why if we ask them to do research besides the class, most likely they will have a hard time managing it. That's why we include the research activities into our lab, in our regular lab or coursework. And that way, students have to invest just the class time to learn research. So they do the lab, regular lab, as well as the research. That way, they don't have to spend extra time to do the research, uh, whereas that's almost impossible to do uh, in an internship. That's why most of our students go to internship during summer. Setting-wise, usually we run this type of research work in our teaching lab, regular teaching lab, without any uh, added facility or 
uh, resources. So whatever resources we have or whatever lab setup we have, that's good enough to run that type of uh, research work. But uh, research intensive must likely happen in a very focused lab. For example, we have some students working in water uh, testing labs. Some might be working in pharmaceutical industry. So they are very focused and advanced lab where they work. And obviously, research-wise, they might learn a lot doing internship. But access-wise, we have better access to all the students. And we can include all the students into research work through Cure Project. So now, let's go over what the whole structure looks like, what the whole cure structure looks like. So uh, the Professor Dolan, with uh, some of her co-workers, created a, uh, a crafted a structure of cure project uh, based on what are the context of cure project and, uh, and what are the activities we do in cure project, as well as what are the long-term and short-term outcomes out of that cure project, okay? So you can go over there, so it shows like what possible context of cure project. So uh, context would be, maybe a student might work individually or they might work in a group, no matter what they do, depending on how we design our cure project. Some of our project might involve just an individual project or some of our cure project might be group project, okay? Depending on that, we'll have either group or individual student doing the research, but all of them will be mentored by faculty. So they get to interact with faculty directly and our TA, TA are assisting with us. Uh, so, that's the context, and now these are some of the activities they go through. So obviously, all of these activities, if you go through this list, you'll see these activities as a normal scientific process of doing research or doing work. So obviously, it starts with uh, some, some skills to collaborate, so taking note, some practice, some skills that needs, that is required for doing research. It's like working on the tool or the instrument they need to run for the experiment or so. Then after that, they have to know how to review a literature, so how to read the background, to prepare themselves to carry out the uh, uh, experiment. After that, they will learn how to design methods, and they will learn how to collect data, process the data, analyze the data. And after that, depending on whether the result or the uh, final outcome is as expected or not, they might iterate that whole work back by reconstructing the research question. So depending on the evaluation and the result they got, they might have to restructure their research question. They might have to do more uh, literature review and redo the whole work. That's the normal process of scientific uh, research. And based on that, so they can decide the future direction. If they have to modify their project, they can do so. Or especially in Cure, a student might not involve for years in cure project, but whatever, whatever result we get, we as a faculty, we use that result to improve our cure project next year. So I have done that so many times in my organic chemistry class. I, I give them a project, they start the project, do the project, and based on the result they get, I modify my cure project next year. So that would be a good iterative work they do. So whatever they do, they have to present it. So depending on, different what cure project we are talking about, we have different way of uh, presenting those things. Some of our course ask them to just write a normal lab report and some of the, co some of the cure course ask them to uh, present it in front of audience or uh, write a proper research article based on their results. So we actually practice all forms of communication in our cure project. Now, here are some short term and long term outcomes, okay? And you can see these outcomes of doing cure might be as basic as uh, having better knowledge about the content. So basically after doing the research, so I, I can give uh, the example from my own cure course. So I teach organic synthesis in my organic chemistry class. And it's more, more theoretical. So I teach like, okay, if you do this and this reaction, if you mix this and this, you'll get this. But when they do that in research, actually mixing those chemicals and whether it works or not, that gives a next level of understanding. It is not as easy as what they read in the textbook, right? It says, mix these two chemicals and heat at 100 degrees Celsius, you'll get the product. It is not like that. It doesn't work like that, right? So they have to be very cautious while setting the reaction to finishing it off, including the purification step also. So some of the, some of the learnings over here, like, a, they will have better analytical skill, better technical skill. These are some of the basic outcome uh, uh, doing any research. Including that one, there, there would be some high impact outcomes also in a long run. For example, 
They might have better science literacy. They might develop better resilience and grit. Uh, they might find the science uh, identity, right? Basically, depending on what's their background and where they come from, now they might like the biology better and they might, seem, they might see themselves becoming a biologist or becoming a chemist, right? So they will find that science identity. And that might lead to a better career and more clarity in their uh, career uh, um, goal or so. So these are some of the outcomes we have seen our student in last four years too. Now, let's go over why do we need research in undergraduate um, uh, students, okay? So we all know we have uh, lab, right? So we have, most of our STEM courses uh, have prerequisite lab. That means we have a lecture as well as lab for each of the course we teach over here. And all the lab involves similar process. They do the experiment, they have the observation data, collect and analyze and report writing or so, right? And how doing regular lab is different from doing a research. One of the major difference between doing a research versus lab is the uncertainty related to research. We pick a topic, we uh, formulate a research question, and we explore based on data, right? Without any clear idea what would be the outcome because we have to present whatever we observe. But in lab, it, labs are structured in a way we know what's, what should be the outcome, right? So we, we look for that outcome, and students will be less challenged. I will not say they will not be challenged, but that's less challenging. And some of the skills that can be developed through research can never be developed through lab, okay? That's why it is, if anyone, is wants, anyone wants to be a scientist and work as a scientist, it is really important to have research experience as well as the lab experience. Lab experience will teach them the skills and tools they need, but research experience will teach them that if we, one of like, they will, like research experience will prepare them psychologically. Like what it feels like failing the experiment, right? And how to recover back from there. How to redesign the experiment if it fails, right? So those things can be learned through research. And uh, some of the benefits of these research are highlighted in some of the publication. I wanna show you this data. It was the survey done by American Association of Colleges and Universities and that clearly shows employers are more interested to hire uh, graduates with research experience. So if you compare these two columns over here, so this one represents the uh, candidate who completed at least one internship, and this one represents the candidate that has done at least one research, okay? So uh, again, these research are more like uh, undergraduate research, like cure type of research. And uh, although internship looks like more uh, impactful compared to research, but again, I wanna remind you, we cannot provide internship opportunity to all of our class, right? That's why that gap can be filled by incorporating more research work into our course. And uh, this data shows the impact of doing research. And here, there is another research, uh, another work done in UT Austin. Uh, it is a pretty large uh, study done somewhere around 2022. And they uh, included almost 4,000 students in their study. And they have like half of the student going through some freshman research initiative. They go through multiple research opportunity during their degree work. And there are half of the students who never get that opportunity. And you can see, based on uh, the exposure, usually the student with uh, research experience, research exposure, uh, have higher percentage of STEM degree and higher percentage of degree completion within six years. And even the cumulative GPA is higher compared to the one without research experience. And uh, that study shows at least the research experience will motivate them further to excel the science they want and do better in their study and it, it might even uh, uh, motivate them to complete the degree on time. So now, based on those data, let me summarize some of the benefits of uh, undergraduate research and these benefits are somehow outlined by the Council on Under Undergraduate Research. And here are some of the benefits. So basically, by doing research, we can build a better mentor relationship. So I have failed that on my own. So while I was just teaching lab versus the research, now I get more time for more in-depth discussion. So when we do research, students usually come to my office, even like during off hour or during late hours, we sit together, we discuss about the outcome, discuss about the problem, right? So I get more time to discuss about the difficulties they are having, and that way we are building better relationship, mentor-mentee relationship through research. 
And next one is, obviously, while going through such uncertain and challenging problem to solve, they have more, like better critical thinking, creativity, problem solving skill, and intellectual independence. They basically grow to be more independent researcher after going through this type of research experience. And next one, obviously, after going through this, they will have better understanding of research methodology, the way to do uh, research. And most importantly, we will basically promote and induce a innovation-oriented culture in our future generation so that they will be more innovative and will think about solving other problems they have around them. And next one, this is the most important outcome, I would say, because it will prepare them for the future career if they want to go for a job right after the undergraduate. They, it will prepare for, for the, the, them for the job as well as graduate school, professional schools or so. So these are some of the major benefits of doing undergraduate research. And uh, so I want to go over, uh, show you some data. So this data shows uh, the, our country with almost lowest STEM uh, degree, like STEM graduate rate compared to other developing and developed nations. So you can see we have like only 96%, 19.6% 9, of undergraduate getting STEM degree. Whereas our country is one of the, uh, our country has one of the biggest STEM employers, right? We have that biggest STEM employer community, but we are graduating only 19.6% of our undergrad with STEM degree. Compared to other nations, something like India, you can check they are, they are um, graduating around 34% of their undergrad, undergrad with STEM degree, whereas Malaysia is graduating almost half of their undergrad as with STEM degree. That shows we need immediate attention to enhance the enrollment retention as well as graduation our, of our STEM uh, students. There is one more data I, that really uh, kind of hit me hard. Here, when you go to this data, you will see uh, gender uh, representation in our STEM degree. And here, uh, the red or uh, uh, orange color represent female and blue and sky blue represent male. And here, they have compared uh, the STEM representation by gender um, um, data coming from 2011 to 2012 to 2020 to 2021. It is like a, after a decade. And you see, even after a decade, uh, the ratio-wise, the STEM gender-wise STEM representation looks same. So we are still male-dominated uh, in, in STEM uh, degrees, right? So we, we, we are, so it looks like we are closing the gap, but we, th there is a huge difference between females graduating with STEM degree as well as males graduated, uh, graduating with STEM degree. And having more females or males into our research work uh, can motivate them to go for a STEM degree and maybe we can enhance the graduate rate doing so. All right, so um, this is a kindred spirits talk, so I wanna talk a little bit more about you know, equity and how these course-based research opportunities uh, relate to equity. So to start off kind of with the issue um, is that we see these persistent uh, gaps in outcome for historically underrepresented groups. So this is data from uh, an organization that we work with a lot called the Scala, um, showing uh, you know, different outcomes um, for people who have started a college degree, whether they have completed where they started, completed a different institution, um, whether they're still enrolled or not enrolled at all after six years. And so what we're seeing here is there are gaps here for these historically underrepresented groups um, for uh, black individuals and Hispanic or Latinx individuals as well. So we have these, these outcome gaps. Um, that's the problem. And so how does the course-based research um, kind of relate to that? Um, and just another you know, aspect of this problem is that STEM specifically, these are, these are for all higher education, is generally going to have lower retention and graduation rates um, compared to other degrees, other, other um, majors. Okay, so that's the problem. How does, how does a cure relate to that? Well, uh, there we go. Um, might be a battery there. Yeah, that's what I was doing. Um, so, as Umas was explaining, you know, historically these research opportunities are only available to um, a small subset of students. They're outside of courses, they're an internship or, um, or some sort of job like that. 
And so the students who are you know, able to do those, it's gonna be you know, subject to a lot of the uh, equity you know, inequalities that we see. Um, you have to have that extra time. Often these are unpaid opportunities and things like that. Whereas cures ensure that all students get to research this experience and it's built into the coursework that they're doing. Um, we know from the data that participation in these cures has been shown to increase retention, graduation rates, um, enrollment in graduate programs. And so this, uh, we, you know, we see this for all students who participate in cures, but we tend to see uh, somewhat of a disproportionate benefit, disproportionate increase for students from underrepresented groups. Uh, Another way that these cures can help um, with some of these equity uh, problems, challenges that we face, are um, help fostering this identity. So Omas talked about this a little bit um, in the theme for these kindred spirits is equity and intersectionality. So just talk a little bit about you know, how we all have this kind of intersectional identity based on all these different factors, race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexual orientation, nationality, all that sort of thing. And one aspect of that might be, you know, your kind of occupation or, you know, you know, what do you do, what do you study in school? So part of the goal here is to uh, develop this identity as uh, a scientist or a mathematician or an engineer uh, in these students um, from the very beginning. And how a cure helps with that is that you're actually doing real science in your course room. Um, you're, you're, you, know, you have this kind of unexpected outcome. So traditionally, a lab in an undergraduate classroom might be a, what we call a recipe-based lab where you have your instructions and you follow those instructions and you, you get the outcome. And the outcome is kind of predetermined and if you get the right outcome, you get a, you get a gold star. And if not, then you know, maybe you do something wrong, maybe you get to try it again. More often than not, you're probably just gonna move on and go to the next thing. Here, we're, you know, I guess, um, you know, that process is not really reflective of how science actually works, right? The whole point of doing science is we don't know what the outcome is, right? There's this um, excitement that comes with that, right? I think most scientists could, could tell you the first time they looked at their own data and learned something from that data that they didn't know previously, right? It's foundational to science. And so with a course-based research experience, we're now building that into their classes. They're doing these activities where the outcome is uncertain um, and you know, we're doing real science. And doing that, hopefully, will, will help foster this identity. Another aspect of our cures here that's unique, and I'm gonna start talking about the specifics of what we're doing here, is that it's place-based, right? So place-based learning, um, you know, is this other aspect. It's not necessarily part of a cures, but here we've very much implemented in our cures. So the things that we're doing are, are tied to specific areas and communities. And by doing this, now we're providing this real world examples of the stuff we're talking about in these science classes. It highlights kind of the relevance of these concepts, how they connect to things outside of just pure basic science. And so one of the unique things about our cure is that we, we have very much tied it up with place-based learning. And so when we think about the SLV, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine a better place for place-based learning, right? This is um, you know, the place with the kind of most you know, sense of, of place when you are here uh, is higher than, than pretty much anywhere else I've ever lived, right? You know when you're in the valley, there's a unique uh, ecosystem, unique geography, unique culture here. And so it's an, it's an excellent place to do this. And so our general framework is, you know, the SLV. We are bordered on the east by the Sangre de Cristo Mountains and on the west by the San Juan Mountains. And we've kind of used this as somewhat of a natural laboratory. These mountain rangers are Similar in a lot of ways, they're pretty similar ecosystems, but they have some differences. They have unique geology, they have somewhat unique climate, and they have unique land use histories and human impacts. So uh, the Sangres, for example, have largely been under, at least the Northern Sangres, have been under um, 
wilderness protections for the last 50 years, been used largely for, for recreation, um, whereas the San Juans are also used for recreation, but uh, a lot of the sites we go to also have uh, grazing, uh, lease going on, so there's um, you know, just differences there. So we can use this as kind of this natural laboratory where we can compare these two mountain ranges and um, see, do these factors like the geology, the climate, the land use, uh, how is that impacting various, various things? So we've identified a number of sites uh, in these different mountain ranges and uh, we use those as our field sites. Another unique thing that we've been able to do with this framework is um, use this framework across multiple different STEM disciplines. So we're not just doing this um, in, in you know, one department, we are doing this in uh, across four STEM programs, chemistry, biology, geoscience, and math. And the same cure is, you know, same research framework rather is used in 13 individual courses across those different disciplines and spanning the range from 100 level to 400 level classes. So students kind of as soon as they start here at Adams in their uh, introductory STEM classes are introduced to this framework and then they're going to see it um, continuing on through their time here. And so um, you know, we kind of have this, this pathway that we think about through these different courses. You know, different students are going to uh, go through these courses at, at different times. Um, but there's just a variety of activities that we can do with this you know, common research framework that we have here. So we have GIS analysis of variability in the watershed in some of our geoscience courses. We look at the chemical uh, biodiversity screening of these different watersheds and compare what's the chemical composition of the water in one range compared to the other range. The students are then taking that data, taking it to their math statistics class and doing statistical analysis on this. And then in some of our higher level classes we do um, some really advanced genomics work, advanced chemical sensing methods where Students are actually developing their own methodology, their own measurement techniques at this point. Um, yeah, so there's this kind of continual progression through these classes. Okay, so uh, I'm one of the uh, STEM faculty uh, like who designed uh, uh, several, uh, two uh, to be specific, Cure uh, courses and implemented those courses over the last four years. Uh, here I'm summarizing uh, all of our cure courses that we do in our chemistry department. Uh, we have designed uh, cure projects or cure courses uh, at three different levels. Uh, so we uh, introduce our 100 level student in their very first year of their college to the cure project that, that is designed for uh, general chemistry class. And uh, when students go through that class doing that cure project, basically we focus on teaching them what are the different commercially available tools to do, do the water analysis. So here we uh, are uh, analyzing water uh, to basically align with the goal of doing place-based learning. So uh, as, a, as a, um, you know, like we are basically contributing uh, to the analysis just by doing chemical analysis. So we collect the sample, water sample, and biology department might do microbial screening, but we do chemical screening, right? And we look for any dissolved ions we have in the water, and that might be connected to uh, the geology around that water set, or uh, whether there is any uh, external intervention around that water set or not, right? So we might answer that question also. So that's our goal. So, so to do the water analysis, basically identifying dissolved ions in water, uh, there are certain uh, commercially available tools that we introduce our student to. So one is ion selective electrodes. So we can use ion selective electrode to analyze the presence of certain type of ion in water. Uh, next one, very popular tool that we use in lab is pocket uh, colorimeter uh, that can 
be used to identify certain other type of iron. So first they learn how to use those tools. And then they learn how to prepare the sample. It's not like we just collect the sample and immediately dip that iron selective electrode into that sample and measure it, right? We have to go through a preparation process and they learn that too. And after that, they learn to design their own experiment and uh, collect the data, analyze the data, and then they are supposed to write a report on that. So that's the level of work they do at introductory level chemistry. So after they are done with that course, the, the very, very next uh, chemistry course they usually enroll is Organic Chemistry 1, OCHEM 1, which is Chem 321. And actually, I have created a year-long uh, cure project for both OCHEM 1 and OCHEM 2. And uh, in OCHEM 1, 321, we focus on uh, learning the background and basics. So that starts with reviewing the literature, right? So uh, doing research in organic chemistry is quite challenging. Just knowing the basics from textbook won't be sufficient. They have to read the literature about the topic they want to do research in. And our goal is to uh, design and synthesize some organic molecule that can sense ions. So basically our goal is to make molecular uh, ion sensors. That's why we spend one semester of organic chemistry just doing literature search and then they uh, formulate their research question and write the proposal based on that. So here, a student will work individually, although we have more collaborative and group discussion while going through that process. But each student is supposed to identify a molecule that they want to synthesize, uh, what kind of modification they want to do on the uh, standard molecule that, uh, that has been reported, and what are the strategies they will use? And they have to write proposal on that. So each individual student will turn in their proposal by the end of semester. And next semester, when they enroll into OCHEM 2, they have chance to implement that proposal they have. They go to lab, synthesize that molecule, and then at the end, they write the report in the form of proper research article. So I ask them to follow general, uh, Journal of Chemical Education. So they have to write a proper research article based on their research work. And second semester will be more group activity. So uh, based on the proposal submitted on first semester, I group them into five or six groups based on their interest. For example, if three of the students have submitted, submitted proposal for similar ions, I group them together. And then they sit together and decide what they want to do together. And uh, so this, this uh, cure will basically teach them a way to do advanced organic synthesis and method development. That's the focus of our second cure project. But the third cure project is more focused on, uh, you know, giving them opportunity to compare different types of tools and find out which tool is based for what type of ion detection. It is more like it, this course will prepare them more for the employment as well as a graduate school. So basically they learn how to figure out the tool that can give more accurate and precise measurement. Okay, so that's the focus while they are going through analytical chemistry class. So that's how we have like three levels of chemistry cure project and they go through basic level to advanced level chemical research as they go through these three cure, group of cure projects. So here are some of the work produced by our student from some of our cure project and um, they did quite well. So I'm really excited to go forward and uh, work more on this side. All right, so I'll talk briefly about just one of our biology cures. Um, so I teach mostly cell and molecular biology. And so I think you can look at this framework we have and see that uh, you know, we can go learn about the environment and, and what's out there. But I have a lot of you know, pre-med, pre-dental, pre-health students. So how is you know, these creeks related to them? Well, um, one aspect, one thing we do here is you know, who has heard of a, a microbiome before? Right? The microbiome receives a lot of attention. It's really important to your health and uh, especially your, your gut microbiome, but there are microbiomes everywhere. And one of the things we're doing is measuring those microbiomes in creeks in the, the San Luis Valley. So we have a uh, procedure that we go through where we, we can't, you know, collect data, extract DNA from it, sequence that DNA. That tells us the different microbes that are living there. And we can, you know, 
do that. We're doing that in our cell and genetics lab. Uh, this is the same procedure that you would use to measure the microbiome in a human and make conclusions about human health. Um, so yeah, we see that there are differences in the microbiomes between the different mountain ranges here. Um, you know, just quickly to touch on some of these impacts. So we have a lot of data that we're collecting along with this to see how is it helping our students. We have a lot of measures of their identity and their motivation, and we're still kind of in the process of, you know, analyzing that data and drawing conclusions there. But briefly, we can say that, you know, we have about 250 different students participating in these cures every semester. Some of the, uh, you know, things we've been able to, to offer is paid TA ships to work um, after you've taken one of these cures. You can go back and serve as a TA there and get paid for that. And so we've been able to offer that to you know, over 60 students. Um, this cure research provides students with the ability to communicate their research and get this professional level practice uh, here at Adams and in external conferences. So we've had, you know, again, over 80 students uh, presenting their research now outside of a classroom um, here at Adams or, or at a conference. And in fact, I'm taking five students next week to, uh, to Fort Collins to present on some of their research. So the continuing challenges here uh, is that the research needs to continually evolve. If we're doing a, an actual research experience, um, you know, you learn, you do the research, you learn something, and then you have new questions that you have to answer. And if this is going to be authentic research, um, we need to kind of continually change the questions that we're asking as we learn new things. Um, and it's, you know, a challenge to do that uh, with limited time and resources. We're not a research institution. We don't have a ton of support for independent research. Um, doing this across multiple programs with different faculty just means more coordination, more communication that we have to do to make this work. And then there's the, the ongoing challenge of uh, taking what we've done with grant funding and institutionalizing it and making it permanent a lasting change here at Adams. So, um, in conclusion, uh, you know, this is kind of everything we are able to, to offer to students uh, here um, with these course-based research experiences. And I think we're pretty much out of time here, so I'll just, maybe we have time for a question or two. Any questions? Yeah, so the question is, you know, how did we come up with this common research framework? Um, and I have to admit that that was developed uh, before I joined this project and before I started working on these. Um, so I can't speak to the specifics, but I think, um, you know, just uh, the people that were here that did develop this project, um, you know, just kind of recognized that opportunity we had uh, to look at these different mountain ranges and to incorporate that. We, we do have some of those people here if they'd want to comment on that at all. <laughs> All right, anything else? All right, well, thank you all for coming out today. We really appreciate it. I'm getting towards the end of the semester, and everyone's busy. So uh, thank you guys for coming out. <laughs>